The left got COVID almost entirely wrong, and why it matters. A collective consensual grassroots approach to a systemic crisis is always desirable over narrow self-interest. But when a collectivist approach is forced onto populations from the top down and big money is involved, human rights abuses will inevitably follow. Mandate critical. The discourse concerning the pandemic's response for many in left and progressive political camps has fallen into two monocultural fields. You're either for the science or you're a Trumpist conspiracist. Such reductionism has not only contributed to human rights abuses, it has also helped usher in a bleak new period of authoritarianism and unprecedented surveillance. If the left isn't performing its usual tasks of exposing industry capture, revolving door corruption and human rights abuse, who is going to do that work? Throughout the COVID period, much of this work has been carried out by those more likely identifying politically as centrist or on the right. This has left the left somewhat groundless, with no other place to go than become the inadvertent fan club of aggressive medical globalization. Rather than examine this phenomenon critically, many in leftist circles have doubled down and become apologists for some of the most powerful and ethically dubious corporations in the world. An article recently written by retired academic Terry Lee, published in Arena Quarterly No. 9, exposes all the typical straw man arguments the left has promulgated about mandate critical dissidents from across the political spectrum. Lee's wayward growths, permaculture, low tech and the freedom movement is riddled with inaccuracies, conceit and falsities and is illustrative of a broader left ideology concerning the pandemic response. Few leftists have adequately critiqued the pandemic response, let alone the left's COVID failure. Lee refers to an article published in Medium by Heather Jo Flores as a solid reference for his argument, attacking the co-originator of permaculture, Dr. David Holmgren, and my collaborative practice and research with Meg Ullman as artist as family. However, Flores' writing was so slanderous and libelous that she deleted all records of it from the internet. Lee not only omits the fact it was taken down by Flores shortly after it was published, but also omits to mention the backlash for it was overwhelming, regardless of what side of the mandate debate a reader was on. Lee instead suggests Flores' writing on the subject was widely supported and is still circulating. This is untrue on both counts. The science isn't in regarding masks, lockdowns and vaccines. Anyone who has followed the scientific arguments for and against these enforced measures knows this. For example, a large Danish randomized controlled trial in late 2020 showed there was 1.8% of those in the mask group and 2.1% of those in the control group became infected with SARS-CoV-2 within a month with this 0.03 point difference not being statistically significant. So what has been the point of mandating leaky masks and vaccines? Leftists generally, but not exclusively, have become some of the most enthusiastic users of the shame label anti-vax, rather than championing the rights of dissidents who have been mask, lockdown and or vaccine mandate critical. By prioritizing base behavior language such as anti-vax over more nuanced language such as mandate critical, the left has significantly abandoned its post. Referring to the forthcoming mandatory mask-wearing laws for those Germans who cannot show on-the-spot authorities their current vaccination status or test results, Berlin-based playwright and satirist C.J. Hopkins writes, quote, what is happening is a new official ideology is being imposed on society. 
It is being imposed on society by force, and now those of us who refuse to conform to it will be ordered to walk around in public wearing visible symbols of our non-conformity. I'm sorry, but the parallels are undeniable. End quote. Lee enthusiastically employs the anti-vax shame label rather than investigate whether vaccine mandates constitute human rights abuse or are indeed legal. The pejorative use of anti-vax is akin to how the term terrorist was applied to any person who identified as Muslim in the Howard Bush Blair era. Back then, this shaming tactic mostly came from the right. As Glenn Greenwald argues, quote, the term anti-vax has expanded so widely that even vaccine advocates such as Jeremy Coburn and trade unions are now included by virtue of defending bodily autonomy, end quote. For anyone who champions human rights, based behaviour language such as anti-vax should sound alarm bells, especially if it is being promoted by government, in news media and in critical journals like Arena Quarterly. Ministries of Truth Lee's views about which news medias can be trusted shines a light on who has shaped his thinking over the past few years. He suggests to his readers that in order to get to the truth about the pandemic, they would be best served by taking out subscriptions with The Age, The Guardian and or The New York Times. I've also read these medias throughout the pandemic and referenced them alongside many others, as well as hundreds of papers, opinion pieces, scientific articles and commentators from across political, scientific and social spectrums. In Artist as Family's video, How Do We Solve a Problem Like the Unvaccinated?, we take a critical look behind the curtain of Fairfax Media and understand why the age has been so enthusiastically bugling the same tune as the global vaccine lobby. The age is owned by Nine Entertainment and the former conservative politician that is most influential on that governing board is Peter Costello, who is also chairman of the Board of Guardians of the Australian Future Fund, where he has, in recent years, invested in pharmaceutical companies to the tune of two billion Australian dollars, including equity holdings in Pfizer worth 188 million Australian dollars. Costello is a managing partner of BKK Partners, a boutique corporate advisory group run by former Goldman Sachs, J.B. Weir managers, and in 2008, Costello was appointed to the World Bank's Independent Advisory Board. When we read any Fairfax media today, we are duty-bound to know who the influences are behind the curtain. This example of conflict of interest that the politically savvy board chair of Nine Fairfax also invests in Pfizer is what leftists should ordinarily consider a revolving door between state and corporate interests and a place of likely corruption. It's the kind of subject left authors and readers would have traditionally scrutinised. It's depressing and frightening to witness the level of capitulation amongst leftists who have instead championed the paternalistic white boys of the pandemic, Gates, Fauci, Borla, Schwab, Biden, Andrews, Trudeau, Macron, Morrison, et al. And attack the likes of Artists' Family and Holmgren, who have nothing to gain or main maintain, except our integrity, for signalling likely corruption and deceit. Alex Berenson, a former New York Times journalist who reported on the pharmaceutical industry for that media outlet, has been another source we've followed who gives an antithesis view to his old employer. Berenson, who The Atlantic labelled the pandemic's wrongest man, has been consistently more accurate on the subject than any writer on that so-called progressive platform. On the 2nd of August 2021, Berenson was removed from Twitter for posting, quote, It doesn't stop infection or transmission. Don't think of it as a vaccine. Think of it, at best, as a therapeutic with a limited window of efficacy and terrible side effect profile that must be dosed in advance of illness. And we want to mandate it? Insanity. End quote. The truth of this tweet has arguably become undeniable, and a few weeks ago Berenson was reinstated on Twitter 
after that platform settled in court with him and his tweet was reinstated. No evidence could be found to maintain that this was misleading, though the Atlantic or any other corporate media who slandered him haven't as yet apologised for the misinformation they promulgated. The safe and effective misinformation campaign has rightly eroded the public's trust. Until the pandemic, in my naivety, I was unaware of any conservative like Berenson who could be bothered to expose regulatory capture or corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, which, to my mind, is structurally right-wing. Leftists like Western Sydney University's Paddy Rowlandson were the ones sounding alarm bells with pieces like Immunity and Impunity, Corruption in the State Pharma Nexus, 2017. From Artista's family's COVID research, it has become clear the vaccine lobby has been working hard for at least two decades to silence any public debate, even concerning what should be fairly uncontroversial over prescription and the profit motivations for that. As we investigated in our November 2021 video, Fact Check COVID Vaccines Work, They Are Safe and Are Stopping Transmission, Pfizer and other pharmaceutical companies wine and dine doctors and nurses around Australia, paying for conferences and lunches. This is what is meant by industry capture. We argue throughout our COVID video series that industry capture is in such plain sight today that no one even sees it. Israeli professor Samuel Shapira, who received three COVID jabs before being seriously injured by his third, is now attempting to raise concerns about Pfizer's synthetic biology. Shapira was a leading scientific champion of the COVID vaccines when he served as director of the Israel Institute for Biological Research between 2013 and 2021. Twitter, who has no expertise in biology, let alone vaccinology, is now censoring Shapira, as it has with countless antithesis doctors, medical scientists and science journalists over the past two years. Twitter recently threatened Shapira with being removed from the platform if he did not delete a post which stated, quote, Monkeypox cases were rare for years. During the last years, a single case was documented in Israel. It is well established the mRNA vaccines affect the natural immune system. A monkeypox outbreak following massive COVID vaccination? It is not a coincidence. End quote. You won't find Shapira's perspective or others like it shared in The Age, The Guardian or The New York Times, although we did report in one of our COVID videos an article that got through the editorial gates of The New York Times back in December 2021, titled Israel Considers Fourth Vaccine Dose, But Some Experts Say It's Premature, where the journalists reported that some senior Israeli scientists are warning too many shots might actually harm the body's ability to fight the COVID-19 virus, leading to, quote, immune system fatigue, end quote, and thus making the vaccinated more susceptible to covid we are surely seeing this unfolding now in the most vaccinated countries. Since 2010, The Guardian has accepted at least 13 million US dollars from vaccine investor and promoter Bill Gates, according to Gates' own website. Money with which The Guardian was able to set up their global development site for the express purpose of communicating global health and development awareness and analysis. Did Lee ask his readers to observe a possible conflict of interest between someone who profits from new vaccines being the same person who is giving significant amounts of money to a global media organisation supposedly reporting on them without bias? So rather than promoting these three media platforms and entertainment businesses, The Age, The Guardian and The New York Times, shouldn't Lee be inviting his readers to investigate the long demise of them as reputable places for journalism? As the vaccines, in inverted commas, came into the public sphere, the New York Times insisted they would stop people from getting COVID. President Biden, who has had four doses and contracted COVID twice, 
said the same and worse when he called it a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Instead of this politically motivated rhetoric being denounced by Lee's Ministry of Truth, they parroted and amplified it. The New York Times radically exaggerated the efficacy of the COVID jabs, but instead of investigating who was behind the poor scientific modelling the journalists referred to, the fraudulent trial setups and data recording, and what potential corruption was occurring in the public health institutions that have so evidently lied to the public, the New York Times instead doubled down on the scapegoated fringe, those of us refusing to participate in this global experiment. The Age and The Guardian followed suit, and in his Arena Quarterly piece, Lee, unsurprisingly, carries on with this same position. Furthermore, the ABC has been a grave disappointment. Emergency porn is the ABC's specialty, and for fires and floods and like crises, they have grown a dependable track record over the decades. However, their COVID analysis broke our trust. The slow demise of the ABC has occurred through increased levels of political interference, more so from the coalition, but from Labour as well, in Labour's failure to protect the ABC's independence. A former ABC investigative science reporter, Dr Mary Ann DeMarcy, who was silenced for exposing the lucrative overprescription of statins from the pharmaceutical industry, namely Pfizer, has been one of many independent sources we've followed throughout COVID to aid our research. We refer to a little of her research in various videos, though feature her work in our December 2021 video, Can We Trust the ABC and the FDA?, where we expose conflict of interests with senior ABC COVID spokesman Dr. Norman Swan in relation to his medical advertising and his chemist-to-you pharmaceutical delivery businesses. Industrial medicine, contiguous with industrial civilization itself, is not and can never be sustainable because it is almost completely reliant on non-renewable materials. Why would anyone invest in medicines that ultimately have no long-term future for populations, thus making us dependent on therapeutics that probably won't be around after the short life of the next and final mining boom that is the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Why would we not take an innate immunity approach to SARS-CoV-2 for the majority of people for which the disease is mild and thus develop herd protection through engagement and participation with the living of the world, rather than go along with a domination or mass mining approach to medicine. The Far Right Straw Man In his Arena Quarterly piece, Lee attempts to bind any COVID antithesis thinking to the far right. He uses Artist's family and David Holmgren as examples, though doesn't refer to a single argument or investigative video of ours and barely quotes from Holmgren. Lee instead amplifies a single social media post of a photo of David Holmgren, permaculture elder Sue Dennett, and our youngest son Blackwood attending an anti-mandate march in Melbourne, holding a large permaculture banner. Early on in his piece, Lee himself admits, quote, it would take weeks of research to consider all of Holmgren's points, end quote referring to Holmgren's extensive essay, Pandemic Brooding, Can the Permaculture Movement Survive the First Severe Test of the Energy Descent Future? from September 2021. So rather, Lee, quote, boiled, end quote, it down for his reader, removing the complexity thinking and nuance that this subject so obviously requires and deserves, and putting it in the same ideological camp as the far right. This is why we consider Lee's article a personal attack. It doesn't want to engage with the ideas. At least this is how it appears to those of us subject to his discriminations. But before beginning to write this piece, Ullman and I wanted to be sure we were reading him correctly, so we invited Lee to discuss his contention with us in a face-to-face -face public video. Our intention was to take the reductive argument out of it and open up to generative discussion. Regrettably, Lee declined. Born out of social media, cancel culture feeds on insults and attacks and abhors engagement and generative debate. The impact of this on slower forms of media is evident. 
in Lee's attempt to conflate Holmgren's and our antithesis thinking as being somehow associated with the far right, he radically departs from any reasonable logic. This attack on those of us well-versed in critiquing state corporate collusion, and more specifically the revolving door between government, big pharma and the medical industry, cannot be taken seriously. Rachel Goldlust is another who combines social media hubris and poor scholarship to craft hit pieces on antithesis permaculturalists, including Artis's family, even before the pandemic. Like Lee, Goldlust doesn't bother to interview the subjects she attacks. To sharpen his attack, Lee draws on the anti-Semitic threads of the far right, yet chooses to leave out that two of the three of us he attacks are Jewish, Holmgren and Ullman. Additionally, he doesn't want to inform his readers that we have been vilified throughout this pandemic in parallel ways to political dissidents, Roma and Jews of 1933 to 1935 Nazi Germany. We've experienced economic enclosures and social stigmatization, and we've been blocked from entering public swimming pools, public libraries, and our local council's public events. To laugh off these parallels, or worse, become outraged by the association made between such similar formations of a deplorable or contagion class without proper examination of one's own prejudices and the historical records is to continue the attacks, scorn, and vilification those of us have experienced who have challenged the state corporate COVID response. Not forcing you, just removing your rights until you comply, is one of the many placards we made for a small protest we held outside our town hall when we unvaccinated residents were locked out of this year's International Women's Day event. Ullman herself has served on the organising committee of the annual International Women's Day event, and Sue Dennett is an inductee on the IWD honour roll for her work locally in the community and her work globally as an environmental pioneer. Our video, Forbidden Women, International Women's Day in Segregated Australia, captures some of the pain felt by we deplorables and remains another historical marker of the medical apartheid, segregation and discrimination we've experienced. Another placard at the protest read, Please stop othering the control group. Lab leak. The evidence that COVID was lab engineered through joint US and Chinese funding and accidentally escaped the Wuhan Institute of Virology from where the research was being conducted is greater now than for any other likely origin story. Not that you'd know it in Australia, or at least in the media's Lee quotes as reputable. That is, with the exception of two opinion pieces published in the Sydney Morning Herald by Professor Clive Hamilton back in May and July 2021, respectively. Hamilton states back then that the virus most likely came from the Wuhan lab, just a stone's throw from the Wuhan wet market, In referring to the gain-of-function research that many world virologists knew was taking place at this lab, Hamilton states, quote, the ambition ostensibly was to develop vaccines, end quote. In other words, the objective was to make a bat coronavirus intentionally pathogenic in humans and work out how to make vaccines to counter them. Since Hamilton's opinion pieces were published, Lab leak theory has been essentially shut down in this country, but in almost every other continent, it is still the most plausible theory. In our provocative COVID coming out video, Jab the Kids, we end with a 2016 clip of Peter Daszak, director of New York-based EcoHealth Alliance, who worked closely with the Wuhan Institute of Virology to secure US government funding for the research. In this clip, Daszak boasts about gain-of-function research that he refers to as sequencing being conducted by his, quote, colleagues in China, end quote. He states at the conference, quote, We found other coronaviruses in bats, a whole host of them, and some of them looked very similar to SARS-CoV-1. So we sequenced the spike protein, the protein that attaches to cells, then we, well... I didn't do this work, but my colleagues in China did the work. You create super particles, you insert the spike protein from those viruses, simply bind to human cells, 
and each step of this you move closer and closer to, this virus could really become pathogenic in people, end quote. A member of the audience then asked Dazak and the panel whether this type of research could lead to a man-made pandemic. Four years later, in 2020, the WHO put Dazik in charge of an investigative team to research whether COVID originated in the Wuhan lab. Dazik reported that there was no correlation with COVID-19 and denied gain-of-function research was being conducted there. He also put together a lab leak hit piece in the esteemed medical journal The Lancet and got a handful of virologists to sign it. The piece originally omitted Dazak's conflicts of interest and tried to turn the heat away from lab leak theory, calling anyone who questioned the zoonotic origin theory a conspiracy theorist. If COVID came from a lab, can we imagine how much better the response to the pandemic would have been if scientists had access to the gene sequencing that took place in Wuhan that Dazak was boasting about in 2016? But by acknowledging that all fingers point to lab leak, would require an almighty admission that science itself caused the pandemic. In a culture where science is the unspoken orthodox religion of the day, that isn't going to happen without a whole lot of resistance and probably explains why lab leak theory is still consistently attacked. Rather than critique dubious research projects occurring in contemporary science that few of us have consented to, a scapegoat class needed to be developed to take the heat and turn people's attentions away from the likely source of the pandemic. Vandana Shiva insightfully states in the documentary The Seeds of Vandana Shiva, quote, What we call science is a very narrow patriarchal project for a very short period of history, end quote. For those of us reading the pandemic response as smug paternalism, that has benefited disaster corporatism, the wisdom of her quote resonates. Breadcrumbing Lee utilises the twisted allegory, breadcrumbing, in his attempt to describe how people are wooed by the far right. In the actual folk story of Hansel and Gretel, where the allegory originates, the breadcrumbs signal a rites of passage, a stepping into the underworld of the witch, with gifts of foresight that Hansel initiates. While the forest birds ruin his path-making by eating the breadcrumbs that he's left behind, there is autonomy and an independent, child-led approach that Gretel goes on to develop in order to help them escape the incarceration of the witch. So in the story, the children are not lured by breadcrumbs, but by the gingerbread house of the witch. It's interesting to note here that Pfizer was founded by two men in 1849, a confectionist and an entrepreneur chemist, ushering in a new era of drug luring and profiteering. Lee's use of the twisted breadcrumbing allegory is akin to the same poor scholarship as his anti-vax far-right polemic. Because I don't live in a world where medical science is free from the powerful influences of big money, and because I'm a farmer-gardener, who understands that overdosing a soil ecology with any given nutrient or mineral can have disastrous effects, let alone bringing synthetics into that biome, I believe in bodily autonomy. I also believe in the rights of children to be free from the clutches of globalised corporatism and nefarious billionaires. I believe in the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship and do no harm as the first and foremost principle of medicine. Lee's doctoral work, his gateway to a career in academia, perhaps gives more context for why our values part ways so radically. Lee's thesis, Negotiating Stigma, Approaches to Intergenerational Sex, which is now only available on the International Pedophile and Child Emancipation Forum site, has been removed from all records at the University of New South Wales from where he was awarded his doctorate. Lee advances pedophilia emancipation and describes the taboo of pedophilia as a social construction that is unfairly stigmatised. Rather, we should call it intergenerational sex. His research posits that the social stigmatisation of pedophilia traumatises the child 
rather than adult sexual interests infiltrating the child or adolescent, and he exclusively interviews adults who speak of, quote, positive experiences, end quote, of pedophilia, reflecting back to when they were children or adolescents encountering, quote, intergenerational sex, end quote. He continues this activism in Sex and the Age of Consent, the Ethical Issues, in 1996, where he finds, quote, samples, end quote, in his personal, quote, social network, end quote, who have had positive, quote, child slash adult, end quote, sexual experiences. Some politics of permaculture. At a book launch in Castlemaine earlier this year for Lee's The Politics of Permaculture, where David Holmgren, Sue Dennett, Artist's Family and others were refused entry due to our medical choices, I asked Lee and the associated panel from Out on the Footpath whether they thought the left could take any responsibility for the growth of the far right. Lee didn't bother to answer, however Pam Nealon, who was simultaneously launching her book Young People and the Far Right, gave it a stab, though effectively didn't answer the question either, saying, quote, I'm not sure I answered your question, I couldn't really hear you, end quote. Artist's family documented this event in Castlemaine in our video Some Politics of Permaculture from Inside and Outside the Tent. It appears the arena quarterly piece Lee assembled after this event is an attempt to keep us perennially out on the footpath when in actual fact, for the preservation and health of the left and society more broadly, folk like us need to be inside the tent alongside many other diverse thoughtsmiths from across the political and cultural spectrums to avoid the tent becoming an echo chamber. The more difficult project now, especially for the left, is attending to the human rights abuses that have occurred throughout the pandemic because of the state corporate collusion, the state overreach and the absence of critical left and progressive investigations. We look forward to Arena Quarterly and other left journals and progressive medias addressing these abuses in future with proper scholarship and commitment to human rights, especially in relation to those workers who lost their jobs due to mandates and those who have been harmed by the vaccines. The collectivist approach to COVID, as meted from the top down, demanded we roll up our sleeves for vulnerable people. What we've seen instead is Moderna, Pfizer and profiteers like Bill Gates make a lot of money while vulnerable and previously not vulnerable people become increasingly harmed and economically shafted by this, quote, very narrow patriarchal project, end quote, some call the science. In summary, Artist's family, David Holmgren and Sue Dennett are not right about COVID, just as we are not wrong. Many things we have been accurate about, chiefly, not to trust long-established corporate criminals with our complex biology. Biology that is not static nor remains trapped in our fields or bodies, but biology that is intimately connected to composts, to soils and rock, to nearby creeks and trees, to wattle birds and honey eaters, to earthworms, goats and air currents, to snake, bee and microbe. We're very grateful we trusted our intuition not to follow the directives of nudge units as employed by governments and roll up our sleeves for Uncle Pfizer's little prick. Our solidarity remains with those like us who resisted, those who were coerced in order to save their jobs, those who have been injured and have started to ask questions, those who got jabbed but can see the human rights abuse, and those who, although initially seduced by the propaganda, now openly admit they were foolish to trust the public health messaging. Over the past 17 years, our household has been shape-shifting from industrial mind to ecological mind, that is, from money to gifts, from car to foot, from competition to relationships, from pollution to compost. This, we figure, has been appropriate adaptation for the future we all face. We're not working towards a future where there's a million hectares of medical waste spread across the world's continents, along every other kind of toxic waste hyper-techno-civility produces. Until COVID, we were respected 
even honoured for our radical degrowth neo-peasant transitioning, because we had changed the shape of our economic forms, living richly well below the poverty line in walked-for relationships with the Jarrah land we love and we call home, when COVID hit, we were empowered and resourced enough to say no to Uncle Pfizer and co. Holmgren, Dennett and Artistus family have not had COVID throughout this pandemic and this is in large part attributed to how we live, what we eat and the post-industrial health protocols we put in place. All around us, vaccinated people have fallen ill with COVID, many contracting it twice. This is unsurprising because in Pfizer's six-month trial data, COVID itself was listed as one of the significant adverse events, included in a field of thousands of adverse reactions ranging from cardiovascular, neurological and reproductive injuries and beyond. It is no wonder Pfizer and the FDA attempted to lock up this data for 75 years, which of course went unreported in Lee's three ministries of truth. It took about six months before the vaccines, in inverted commas, started to be significantly administered in Australia. Imagine if people had Pfizer's trial data then. For those of us across the jab and non-jab spectrum who are mandate critical and continuing to resist the coercive state pharma nexus, the heat may well be turned up on us again shortly. If the social costs of the state pharma pandemic response are not thoroughly examined and the nefarious actors not held responsible for human rights transgressions, we will find ourselves vilified again and will see the escalation of state violence put on to mandate critical dissidents. The left has a role in guaranteeing this doesn't occur. Individuals and small cultural groups can't cause much harm to others on a mass scale, but governments and corporates who lie and deceive populations can, especially when they encounter little resistance from the privileged classes. When important decisions are placed in the hands of those who are not held responsible for them, we are surely living in dangerous times. This is by no means a comprehensive breakdown of all the subjects that need to be included in exposing the corruption and misinformation of the pandemic response. A more comprehensive analysis would include the smearing of long-standing therapeutics known to work against COVID in order to greenlight emergency youth authorization for the fast-tracked COVID jabs, and fabricating the myth of asymptomatic or silent transmission in order to justify mask lockdown and vaccine mandates. I hope, however, this serves as a useful document for those interested in the left's COVID failure and what we can all learn from it. As always, we invite your insights, questions and comments, and please share this post if you think it advances the discussion.